I think I'll begin to make a start. I just want to say good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome again to the Division of Counselling Psychology Annual Conference. Particular welcome for those who could not be with us yesterday. Um, uh, you are very, very welcome. Uh, following on from what I said yesterday um, about engagement and having cameras on, please do have your cameras on unless you've got a reason not to. Um, counseling psychology, as I expect you all know, is about relationships and connections. And to, to be engaged is to be connected. And it's easier to engage when we can see people. Today, I can't see anybody because there's something wrong with the setting on my laptop probably yesterday i could see people and it, it's a very very different experience i'm having because i'm actually talking to a screen literally now um i know that sometimes we we want to have our cameras off and in relation to that this session is actually being recorded so if you don't want to be on the recording for whatever reason that's fine then you need to leave your camera off. It'll just show your name. And the same thing if you want to ask questions during this session and you don't want to do it live on screen, then please put the questions in the Q&A um, or in the uh, discussion forum. Um, I don't know whether any of you have used the Meeting Hub yet. I've had a few messages by it, but I haven't actually used the video chat. I can't see you, so I can't ask you to raise your hands if you have used it. But I hope some of you have met old friends on the meeting hub. Let me know if you have. I'd love to hear how it's all going. It is very difficult when we're all online like this, staring at screens um, to feel truly engaged with each other. We actually have over 975 delegates in all, which is amazing. Um, We'd like to apologise for the technical issues of yesterday. They are all sorted now. It was largely thanks to Zoom who decided to do a massive update in the middle of the night, which kind of threw everything out of kilter. Um, but it's been sorted now. So I just want to say thank you to, to Casey Jones for having a plan B, which enabled us to continue just a little late. That's all. It was fine. Um, they're doing a great job. By the way, if any of you are having problems, perhaps you can't hear or you can't see, once you've clicked on the link to this session at the top, you will see something called live support, a, a sort of a red words live support. You can click on that or down the bottom, there is a control room chat. You can go there too. If it's more serious than that, then you might need to give them a call. The number is in the email that you had. Please attend the poster session at lunchtime today. Um, and don't forget that there is actually a Delegates Choice Prize. So please go and vote for, the, for your favourite posters. There are, um, first, second and third places will be announced um, before the final keynote this afternoon. And the first person, the person in top place, will be getting a £50 voucher. So please go and vote because otherwise there won't be any prizes. So thank you. You should have received the link yesterday afternoon. I just want to say that I'm delighted. We are all delighted. that We've got so many undergraduates and postgraduates with us. Just under 40% of the registrations are undergraduates and postgraduates. And it's lovely to have you. Um, we've never had this before and we we just hope that you are enjoying the presentations and getting a flavour of what it is to be a counselling psychologist and how we work and where we work and what we're all about, basically. And um, we will be hold, holding another conference next year and we hope it'll be a person to person one. So in an actual venue, there may be a little bit of hybrid events going on. We hope you'll be able to attend again next year. Um, as for the, for the undergraduates and postgraduates, we'll, we'll remember, because of course we can't offer it free again next year, because this is quite a cost to the division, but we will see if we can come up with some kind of um, bursary system or something like that. Um, today we've got another exciting round of presentations, which I hope you will all find uh, enjoyable. 
Um, do be nice to yourself and kind to yourself. I don't think we were yesterday and we're all exhausted today. So you might find some of us on taking a well-earned break now and then. Um, anyway, um, that only took me five minutes and I'm supposed to talk until 10 o'clock. So I don't know what we do now. Do we take a short break, people? Or is there anything else that I've forgotten? Kate, are you online? Do you want to add in anything? Uh, no, I think you've got it covered there. Thank you. I've got it covered. Thank you. Um, yes, somebody's just said in the discussion forum, it is a different format than yesterday. Um, some people can see everybody and some people can't, from what I understand. I'm not quite sure why that is. Um, yeah. Because Kate and I can only see speakers. We can't see everybody else in gallery view. We don't have that option. So I might give Tom a ring. Yeah, Zoom. My Zoom is launched, okay. It worked, it worked fine yesterday, it launched soon, but today it hasn't. For the attendees, if you click technical issues, launch Zoom, this may, this should pop you out into Zoom rather than viewing in the portal where you should be able to see the other delegates. Ah, oh, okay, I'll try that as well. So I'm going to go out and come back in again. Jill, you stay Thank where you, you are, you won't have that option as a panelist. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> So, um, Martin, I'm going to hand over to you now. I know it's a little bit early, so we could wait a little bit. OK. I might use that as a, um, before we're getting all excited about the upcoming keynote and the panel, I might just pick up um, a point from yesterday's AGM and make a plug for people interested in the division's response to climate change, mitigations, um, responses to questions around ecotherapy. To point out that we have got a work stream being developed within the division, um, but in order for that work stream to do anything productive, to be able to respond to consultations, um, requests for webinars and those kind of things, we do need kind of more hands on board. So if people are um, have some experience in this area or want to develop some and have got some time to contribute to the division's response, please do have a look at the statement of interest um, that was sent around in the, whatever it's called, the email, e-newsletter. Um, and we would be delighted to hear from um, members who want to offer some of their time to the work of that work stream, the environmental and climate change work stream. Um, we probably need about another six people. So, um, don't feel that, uh, you know, somebody else will probably get in there first. Um, do submit these statements of interest um, as soon as you can, really, and we'll be in touch and try and get forward to take that forward. That was my plug there. Um, is it okay if I kind of start the introduction? Um. I was morning. wondering, I think people are still coming in, so, well, they're coming in and going out, maybe they're struggling with them. Um... We're still a little bit ahead of time, should we just give them a few yeah. more minutes, if possible? Okay. Give people a chance to make a last minute comfort break or whatever. I shall hold my enthusiasm for a few more minutes. It's delightful to see some, if you can see the screen, it's delightful to see so many, I didn't realise I knew so many counselling psychologists. I'm jealous, why can't I see you? There's people from overseas, there's people I've known from years back, there's people I'm currently working with, it's... Oh, that reminds me, Martin, one thing I forgot to say, I was going to say who lived the furthest away, and I think um, there is somebody here from Japan, is that right, Cossie? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think they win the prize for being the furthest away. 
but we have people from all over the place. Do you want to tell us some of them, Cosi, while we're waiting? I think it was people in Spain and... Uh, yes, the list is from Malta, France, Qatar, Turkey, China, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Spain, Italy, Japan, Gibraltar and South Africa. Wow. And we don't normally get that at a conference, yes. do we? No. Not we the face-to-face -face one. Uh, Jill, you were muted when you just spoke. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm very cautious with my mute button. Um, yes, we don't normally have that. And I also can hear you from the room next door, you see, so I'm hearing two of you. Martin, there's a question here um, oh. regarding your work stream. Uh, can postgrads join the work stream? Yes, yes. Um, I think the makeup of the work stream has to include a number of qualified people so that, you know, for kind of rhetorical legitimacy. Um, but no, absolutely, there's place for um, student members or postgrads. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, don't let that put you off. And if you want to, um, it's not on here, but my email I think is relatively easy to find. It's miltonm at regents.ac.uk. And you can always kind of email me for an informal conversation about possibilities if you'd like to. Milton M at regents.ac.uk. So how do you see the questions, King? Um, I've split my screen, okay. my laptop. I've got the discussion I can view on the left and everybody else is on the right. Okay. Um, yeah, and another point on that one is that because of, you know, obviously international focus on COP26 coming up in November, um, the sooner we get our heads together, the sooner we'll be able to kind of think about the kind of statement we want to make. I'm already fielding questions from other organisations about liaising with them. Um, and what we need to be cautious about is that, you know, we, we get the voice of the division as opposed to catching me between meetings, making things up on the hoof. So it'd be good to talk to colleagues as and when you want to come get in touch. OK, I just want to um, so just uh, send a message out to all delegates while, while I've got the opportunity. In the actual portal, there are two tabs, one for a discussion forum and one for live Q&A. Um, the live Q&A is really useful um, to scan through because somebody may have already posted a question there, which is very similar to yours. And what you could do is just simply click the thumbs up and what it will do, it will, it will filter all the questions automatically and rank them. So the most popular questions will automatically jump to the top, and that way we'll probably get through a lot of questions later on in the uh, um, later on with the panel. Oh, and um, before we kick off, David, I've got a question for you. Um, are you okay if people officially tweet screenshots of slides? Yeah, fine. That'll yeah. be fine with you, will it? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So I shall just let Neha know the answer to that is yes. Talk about trying to teach old dog new tricks here. I've got clicking between screens. There we go. Oh, where are we at time-wise? Are we okay to start, Jill? Jill, you're on mute. <laughs> yes, yes, Martin, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, right, yes, so I'd like to echo Jill's welcome to everybody today. Um, it is a huge delight for me to be able to convene and host the first two events of this morning. Um, and I hope that you'll all take advantage of what Keaton was pointing you to in able to kind of put questions out there, highlight the questions that you're already interested in. Um, because we've got two parts to this. We've got a keynote special from Professor David Uzzle, who I'll introduce in just a moment. And then we lead on to a question time format um, in 
I was going to say in a related vein, but it, of course it all depends on what questions come in. Um, David's very kindly suggested that we take questions aimed directly for him during that question time period, so that as well as David's perspective on any questions that people have got, other panellists might well be able to contribute to that discussion. So you should probably get quite a lot of input on any questions that people want to put forward. I'll only just, I, I will introduce the panellists for the question time bit a little later, um, but just so that you know kind of the names, we've got Dr. Alison um, Greenwood up there, Dr. Patrick Kennedy, um, Maya Gimalova there, who am I? Oh, and of course, Professor David Azul will be with us then. I will introduce the panelists briefly, more properly, when we make that transition from keynote to question time. Um, but it is a huge delight and a huge privilege, actually, to have um, to be able to introduce Professor David Azul to you. Um, I've known David quite a long time. We both used to. I used to work at University of Surrey, where David also worked. Um, and in order to introduce him, I kind of want, I went through a little bit of research with him and found out some things I didn't know. Um, so David was the first professor of environmental psychology in the UK. He modestly tells me he was the first person with that specific title, but I still think it's a, an important milestone to note. David's an internationally renowned scholar, having more than 40 years in the field, and and I say this with a kind of caveat, and sadly, 30 years plus research into climate change related topics. Now that's not sadly David, but sadly that we've been talk having to talk about this for that length of time and, and feeling increasingly urgent. David, somebody that's given evidence to the Commission for the Study of Climate Change to the deputies of the Spanish Parliament. He gave the 2010 Joint British Academy BPS Annual Lecture to the Royal Society, and he was invited by the APA to represent them at the UN in 2010. So we're hugely lucky. We've got somebody that knows this work inside out and got huge international respect today. He's got a book coming out in September, which you may well want to look at, um, get ready to receive, the Palgrave Handbook of Environmental Labour Studies. But of course, his body of work is huge and you can find it in all kinds of Google Scholar and his own website. David reminds me that he's always worked alongside other disciplines, including architects, sociologists, planners, mathematicians. So it's a huge delight that he's now with us. He can add counseling psychologists to that list. And the final thing I need to tell you before I hand over to David is that he's a lifelong Watford supporter. And with that, I don't know what to say to that. With that, I'm going to hand over to David and I will talk to you all um, at the end of David's talk. Thank you very much, David. Okay, thank you, Martin. Thank you for that introduction, and especially mentioning my team. Um, Martin's brief was to talk about what we know about psychological attitudes to climate change and the psychological aspects of policy in relation to the climate emergency, and then invite therapist colleagues to consider the information and ask them to think about how this plays out in their own lives and in the, in the lives of their clients. Now, I'm going to rattle through fairly quickly what we know from psychology, psychology because I think many of you will be familiar with this. And what we as psychologists know is, is well represented in uh, a number of recent reviews, which I can provide references for um, after this session. So rather than talk, and I'll go to share screen now, hopefully. Um, so rather than um, talk about um, that, I think what I'm going to talk about, what I'm going to concentrate in on is what I think I know as an environmental psychologist, having been working in this area for 30 years, and then how the focus and methodologies of my research has changed as a consequence of seeing research on behavioural responses to climate change, how that has developed over the years, and then to reflect a little on how I think psychology could actually 
often more, much more than it's doing so at the moment. So let me just start by restating the problem and where we as psychologists can intervene. I think climate change will have three effects. And this is a distinction which few psychologists make. Firstly, there's going to be the primary physical effects on people, flooding, drought, and so on. And this is probably where most psychological research has been undertaken, especially in the area of mit mitigation, maybe a little on adaptation. S then there's been the sort of consequential impacts. Um, for example, crop failure, famine, migration, conflict, much less work. And one has to look at partially compatible situations. So there's been work done on the effect of high temperatures on urban violence, health and psychological effects, migration and the potential for conflict. And then the third area is where there are negative consequences caused by the measures and interventions employed by governments and industries to both mitigate, mitigate and adapt to the first two. So this might typically uh, focus on the effect of the effect on work and jobs, and I'm going to be coming back to that a bit later on. Again, there's relatively little research in this area, and much of it will not have been done in the context of climate change, so that one has to generalise from other situations. Oops, there we go. Um, okay. Now, psychologists know a great deal about changing behaviour. It's a long history going back to Kurt Levine and, and before. And the breadth of areas is illustrated in part by the BPS behaviour change briefings, which are available for download from the BPS website, which is, these have been published over the last few years. But the case I want to make this morning is that the problem of climate change is not simply one of changing behaviours. And it's certainly not about corrective behaviours, as was advocated at the recent International Summit on Psychology and Global Health, as if a short, sharp intervention is all that's needed. We know a lot about psychological um, uh, the, uh, the effect of behaviour change and psychological work in behaviour change, but for me it comes with a health warning. Firstly, most of the work, most of the work by a psychologist on behaviour change is highly individualistic. By framing the issue of climate change as a problem caused by individuals through their excessive, inappropriate and thoughtless consumption, we not only restrict our understanding of the potential causes of the challenges we face, but I think we also close down many of the options for taking action. And this is reflected in the title of many government reports, which individualise the problem as being one of consumer consumption. But this inevitably leads to a contradiction. Too often climate change is, dis is discussed as a global issue. We talk about global environmental change, global warming, global temperatures and so on. And I think this encourages people to feel powerless because how can they influence global processes? As Naomi Klein wrote, we're all in a different stage of paralysis with this thing that we know is the biggest issue on earth. Where is the global? someone else's global is our local. The graph on the left there comes from some work I did many years ago in which we asked people in the UK, Australia and Slovakia how serious a range of environmental problems were and in each case they said they were more serious the farther away, the, uh, the farther away they were from them. We also found that feelings of responsibility were inverse to their perception of the seriousness of the problem. Now, since I did that study some 20 years ago, the research has been repeated many times by me with different groups and subsequently by other researchers, and we still get the same results. The problems are somewhere else, and there's little I can do 
because how can I have any control over the global? I think times are now changing. People are aware of climate change. It's now being revealed on our own doorsteps, as we've tragically seen this week in Germany. But one has to ask whether this has led to an increase in feelings of responsibility. We, ca we cannot assume that people are aware that there is a link between what they regard as glo global environmental problems and local practices and lifestyles. Some people may be trying to live more sustainably, such as those able to afford high priced ecological food and use solar panels and heat pumps, but there are still those with a larger footprint because of their lifestyle in general. A second issue is that many psychological um, approaches are linear. <clears throat> this is most typically represented by research for the policy levers, which has been termed carrots, sticks and sermons. In other words, incentives, regulations and education and awareness raising interventions. Knowledge and positive attitudes are important, but in themselves, they are typically not sufficient to encourage behaviour change. Changing attitudes has been seen as the route to changing behaviours, but as we know well, the, the relationship between attitudes and behaviours is very weak. And one might also say um, and, uh, that you know, if we want to change behaviours, perhaps we need to change behaviours rather than go the long way round. I just put that quote in from a, a disability officer uh, in an Australia university that I talked to many years ago, and I thought her comment was rather interesting. Perhaps it's something one might consider in relation to climate change. In recent years, attention has turned to slightly more sophisticated approaches, such as using social norms and peer group pressures and theories of identity in community persuasion exercises. Although still focused on the individual, they set the individual in a social context. For example, this has involved using informal real life social networks, such as neighbors, through motivating the visible behaviors of adopters or, or others to engage in publicly observable, sustainable practices such as recycling. Now, while creating identities which are associated with pro-environmental actu uh, actions can encourage change, it's important to forget that identities can also be a barrier, especially when they're threatened. This is a quote from a European trade unionist we interviewed about proposed transport legislation to reduce diesel trucks on the roads. I should, I should add that much of my research over the last 10 years has been undertaken with and benefited enormously from working with a sociology colleague, Nora Retzel, who I think is in the audience here somewhere. Now, from this quote, as Julio argues, for many people, their ident uh, the driver's identities are intimately tied to their work and professions. Reducing carbon emissions is not simply a technical issue. We have to acknowledge the social issues around the occupation of driving. Threatening particular industrial sectors such as transport with carbon reducing legislation will threaten jobs, which in turn may threaten identities. When people's identities are threatened, they're likely to resist. And this could be a significant barrier to change. Replacing carbon jobs with green jobs also needs to facilitate the emergence of positive, identi positive identities associated with those jobs. Now, regardless of our personal attitudes and values, many decisions and actions we take are locked into the infrastructure of our daily lives. Relatively little account is taken in research on the structural factors in society that can have a significant influence on the opportunities, competencies, abilities and willingness of people to take action. 
and the environmental, familial and cultural contexts in which people live their lives. For example, if urban planners approve the development of out of town shopping centres, which in turn encourage people to buy groceries for two or more weeks at a time, which in turn requires them to use their cars because they can't carry their shopping home on public transport, even if there is public transport, this immediately challenges both their good intentions and attitudes, as well as environmentally progressive transport policies to reduce carbon emissions and energy consumption. Manufacturers not only create products, but they also attempt to construct our, our identities for the products we desire and purchase. The decision to drive a 4x4 vehicle is more often governed by the status, image and identity that such vehicles supposedly confer upon the driver rather than the capacity of the vehicle to meet the driver's practical transportation needs. We're actively encouraged to fly, have two cars, shop till we drop, even in the middle of a global pandemic. And encouraging someone to walk less than a mile to work does not make sense if they have, have to multitask, like take children to school, en route, do shopping, pick up a colleague, and then go to work. So these are all important structural factors which are going to impinge on their ability to, if you like, leave the car at home. Now, clearly, psychologists know how to change behaviours under certain conditions, but the theories, their assumptions behind the model of the person and the general failure to recognise the structural and cultural con constraints and conditions in which people live will mean that scaling up change to the level required will be impossible. For the scale of changes needed to address climate change, it may be more effective to work not on the behaviours themselves, but on the social, economic and environmental conditions that govern and drive people's behaviours and the societal context in which people live. This would almost certainly have a greater impact. But I have another problem with the focus on behaviour in this context. I find it difficult to see or understand a behaviour outside the framework of larger social practices. Behaviours, as Elizabeth Shove would argue, sociologist, are simply the visible mani manifestations of socially embedded phenomena or social practices, or what is referred to as performance. What we call behaviours are literally the tip of the iceberg. In Elizabeth Shove's formulation of social practices, social practices are constructed through the conjunction of socially constructed and shared and shared meanings and images, knowledge and skills, and material infrastructures. This is practice as entity. And it is practice as entity, underlying practice as performance, that is, cru that is a crucial driver for what people do in their everyday lives. Attitudes and behaviours interact as part of a myriad of interactions between shared meanings and images, knowledges and skills, and, and material infrastructures. Thus, focusing on a behaviour ignores its social, societal, place and historical context. Perhaps expressed in ways more familiar to psychologists, attitudes and behaviours which we're so intent on changing may not account for the major part of the variance in explaining action. Is it then not surprising that many behavioural interventions have limited effects? And when they do have an effect, it's probably because they're starting to adjust the practices as entities rather than the practices as performance. To give you an example of this, people do not use energy. People do things which involve materials, competences and have meanings. That is, 
They engage in practices which result in the use of energy. Shove's example of showering is a classic example. We don't shower to use energy, but to get clean. But understandings of cleanliness have changed over time. In medieval times, it was believed in many parts of Europe that water could carry disease into the body through the pores of the skin. So they just washed hands, parts of the face and rinsed their mouths. Washing one's entire face was believed to cause catarrh and weaken the, eyes weaken the eyesight. The church thought that bathing was too sexually arousing and therefore should be discouraged. In the 19th century, bathing was a moral issue and said something about one's social position, that cleanliness is next to godliness. <clears throat> and in the first half of the 20th century, bathing was governed by the available time, facilities and weekly routine. With no instant hot water, time had to be set aside on the half day Saturday afternoon when one wasn't working in order to heat the water, fill the bath and empty the bath. And then, was, then there was the pecking order of having a bath. Now, some people shower three or four times a day. So the desire to shower is not driven by a desire to use energy or water. What has changed has been our understanding of cleanliness and what it means to feel fresh and the implications of this for the use of energy and water. In extreme cases, the shower has become another room. In this advertisement, I've highlighted how the advertising material for this shower encourages and justifies not a behavior, but a complex multi, a complex multidimensional practices comprising meanings and images, knowledges and skills and material infrastructures. Do we really believe that a person who might consider buying one of these showers is likely to be influenced by a behavior change program on saving energy and water? Do we really believe that the theory of planned behavior provides an explanatory account of showering in these circumstances? What showering means and by extension, its implications for the use of energy is not simply a question of attitudes and behavioral intention. Now, over the last 10 years, I've come to three conclusions in, in my work. Firstly, behavior change is necessary, but not in itself sufficient. Climate change is a collective problem and requ requires a collective response. And I hope I've started to make something of a case for the importance of seeing climate change in a social and a societal context. And then thirdly, we need to move from behavior change to social transformation. Social transformation means the restructuring of all aspects of our personal and social lives, from politics to the economy, from the way we, from the way we think, to the way we live. It's a root and branch challenge to think about the way we produce and consume, the way we relate to nature and the life support systems upon which our continued existence depends, and how we can translate, how we, sorry, how we can transition to a low carbon economy and society in a just, fair, caring and participatory way. As Naomi Klein argues, many people have become climate deniers because the problem seems overwhelming and paralyzing. They feel disempowered. Too often, we're told that the solutions to climate change involve giving things up. It's a negative message and negative messages are much more likely to fail. We know from psychological research that people regret a loss more than value again. Too often behavior change campaigns give the impression that putting the environment first means putting the self second. 
In other words, environmental benefits at the collective level will necessitate a sacrifice in, indiv in an individual's living standards, their happiness and their image of the good life. Or as Juliet Shaw express it, expresses it, it's a paradigm of sacrifice. The beginning of action is hope, a hope and, in, and anticipation that what you can do is worthwhile, can make a difference and will end up being better than what we have now, as expressed in this quote, again from Naomi Klein, I'll read it out. If we can chart a path to, po to post-carbon economy, it would involve gaining a lot of other things. We can have a higher quality of life, more livable cities, greater equality, heal historical wounds. It can be exciting. We need a vision that doesn't just take on board the, the catastrophe that is and will be climate change, but it requires a vision in which we collectively use the crisis to leap somewhere that seems, frankly, better than where we are right now. Hope is not taking a, the naive view that all will be well, so let's just look on the bright side, like the closing scene from the life of Brian. Rather, the world should be seen as one of creative possi possibilities that invites us to act. Rebecca Solnit talks about the spaciousness of uncertainty. In the spaciousness of uncertainty, there's room to act. Uncertainty provides an opportunity to take control and to act either by oneself or collectively. So what does hope look like? <clears throat> Psychology is most effective, I think, when it works. Uh, wrong one. Um, psychology is most effective when it works with other disciplines. As C. Wright Mills wrote, no social study that does not come back to the problems of biography, of history, and their intersections within a society has completed its intellectual journey. Now, I found it useful to draw on a life history methodology, which provides a path into precisely what Mills is calling for, an understanding of the relationship between history, biography, and society. It enables us to get away from behaviors and understand actions in their psychological, familial, societal, historical, and place context. So over the last 10 or more years, I've been undertaking life history interviews, drawing on the work of Alessandro Portelli. Now a life history approach asks pe people to tell us their life story, to walk forward in time and tell us how their life has changed over the lifespan. What were the family, community, national, even global influences and forces that which led to changes in their relations, their work, how they traveled, how they consumed, and so on. What were the key moments of change, the fractures in their lives when practices and habits changed? Their practices emerged naturally out of the accounts of their formation and the ongoing progression of their lives. I've been working on a three year project in environmental labour studies, examining the role of individuals in transforming individual in organisations. These individuals are leading regional, national and international trade unionists who have a responsibility for the environment and climate change brief in their trade unions. And we've been interested in how they personally came to see the importance of the relationship between work and the environment and how this intersected with the socialist views many of them held. This was achieved by investigating how individual life histories, organisational histories and societal histories interact 
and intersect to create change. And I want to finish this paper um, with a life history account from of one such unionist, an exceptional person who I think gives us some clues as to how we can overcome the paralysis with this thing that we know is the biggest issue on earth. <clears throat> we interviewed Mike Cooley for just under five hours. It's impossible here to capture the richness of his story, but I'll make some summary points about his formation. Mike was born and grew up in Tuam in the west of Ireland. He talked about the rigidity, conservatism and intolerance of intellectual criticism found in traditional Irish Catholic education. He grew up in a household where his mother wrote poetry about the countryside. His father, quote, loved the countryside as well and had a small garage and service motorcycles and bicycles. In the Second World War, it was difficult to get bikes and his father would make them up from recycled metal. And of that, Mike said, and that was extraordinary to watch and behold, you know, something coming in, a pile of what appeared to be rubbish, and the next thing, there was somebody cycling on it down the road. As a consequence, Mike, again a quote, experienced a tension between my artistic interests, if I might put them like that, and my engineering interests. Years later, along with his engagement with the countryside, this would have a profound influence on his view of the relationship between sustainability, production processes, products and creativity. Mike Cooney came to Britain and in his mid-twenties worked at Lucas Aerospace. He chaired the local branch of the Technical Administrative and Supervisory Section, which was the Union for Engineering Draftsmen and Allied Technicians. Lucas Aerospace in the 1970s was one of Europe's largest designers and manufacturers of aircraft systems and equipment. It produced the combat aircraft and the Stingray missile system for NATO as well as a small element producing medical technologies. It had been supported by the Labour government who wanted a highly profitable aerospace company to compete with other European manufacturers and Lockheed in the United States for the lucrative aeronautical and arms business. The management were required to rationalise the 17 factory operation into a more integrated and streamlined company. It was proposed to close some factories and make thousands of workers redundant. <clears throat> At the time of the dispute, Mike Cooley, with others, formed the Lucas Aerospace Combined Shop Stewards Committee, <clears throat> which comprised blue and white collar unionists. And it was very rare in those days for such unions to work together. The committee set about developing the Lucas plan. The plan proposed that instead of making thousands redundant, Lucas should transform production from military weapons to socially useful products. Some of you will associate this phrase with William Morris and his pamphlet, Useful Work versus Useless Toil. In Mike's word, words, we realised that there was a lot of knowledge on the shop floor and elsewhere, which is not articulated verbally or even in written form. It's people describing and giving of their intelligence through what they do and how they do it, rather than the way they talk and so on about it. So what they, i.e. the Combine Committee did, was survey the physical aspects, what the plants had in terms of tools and machines, and what skills they had. And they did a sort of doomsday book, detailed assessment of all the assets, because the shop stewards on site, they know everybody. They're the sort of people that wander around the factory as a right, and they can rap rapidly build up a picture of the company 
and they did a sort of audit of the company. And then they sent a super suggestion scheme around all the factories, invited everyone to put in proposal. Has anyone got any pet projects which they thought of or which they wanted? And all the little old grey hair engineers from Burnley came forward with, you know, a little box with lots of yellow documents. Well, I did this when I was 25. Hundreds of ideas came out. I mean, some of them were crazy, but some of them were not crazy. Some of the younger ones were obviously up to speed. I mean, some of these workers were top end of the aerospace high tech front. These were people as advanced technically as you get anywhere. From this, the combine produced the plan. The plan took a year to put together. It comprised six volumes of 200 pages each and included designs for 150 proposed items for manufacture, market analysis, and proposals for employee training and restructuring the firm's work organization. Workers sat along designers and engineers to construct not only an alternative production plan, but also an alternative future for themselves. The product ideas included heat pumps, solar cells, a road rail public transport vehicle, which will be lightweight using pneumatic tires on rails, electric vehicles, uh, battery cars, battery driven cars, um, undersea exploration technology, remote, remote control devices for people with disabilities. So an extraordinary range of ideas came out of this. Now, despite the fact that the plan was described by the Financial Times as one of the most radical alternative plans ever drawn up by workers for their company, the Lucas management rejected it out of hand and indicated that they would not diversify from aerospace work, even though the plan demonstrated that these socially useful products would be profitable. It was seen as an, infri as an infringement on their given right to run the business. As a consequence, 2,000 workers were made redundant, including targeting the leaders of the combine. 40 years later, the urgency of the need to profoundly transform our economy has led to a new Lucas Group being established to, to promote these ideas. Last year, workers in the airbase, in an airbase, airbus factory, used their skills to produce ventilator components in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Now, Mike Cooley and the Lucas Aerospace Combine Shop Stewards Committee sought to address what was for them an existential challenge by occupying the spaciousness of uncertainty and seeking to ensure that workers were involved in planning, designing and implementing their future and the future of production, not just for themselves, but for society as a whole. They demonstrated that collective action has the potential to produce the kind of radical transformations that we now need. This comes from seeing links between the different areas of our lives. And that when you put change in people's hands and provide encouragement, nurture and the right and nurture the right conditions, it provides them with hope and energy. Now, what came across from talking to Mike was his boundless faith in the ingenuity of human beings to solve the social and environmental problems that we face. He argued that you cannot be dogmatic and drive change from above, especially where solutions are likely to put people out of work. It requires a participatory process from the ground up, drawing on the creative imagination, skills and craftsmanship of workers. Mike talked about how this participatory approach not only generated more ideas, but enhanced workers' sense of self-efficacy, self-esteem and comradeship. He said, and people came in and they were pouring out ideas. I mean, they were full of ideas. 
because it was amenable, the context in which it was being discussed. It was their own mates who had made this road rail vehicle, so it kind of belongs to us. Now, he thought these ideas would endure, not just in terms of the Lucas organization, but as a way of viewing the world and viewing change and viewing our relationship with technology. Now, Mike Cooley's story is not to abandon the individual in psychology, but to understand the individual in their social context, which becomes an essential part of a transformational change process and where history and society come together. And I'd just like to finish with some, conf some conclusions and reflections. I've tried to get beyond the narrow confines of discussing climate change in terms of behaviour change, as I think psychology has much more to offer than it is at the present. Psychology is not just about answering the questions which governments want answered to satisfy their agendas, interests, donors and preferred ways of dealing with problems. Psychology should be asking challenging questions and out of those questions may come policies and strategies that will enable individuals, communities and societies not only to resist, change, adapt, endure and survive, but also to find their own solutions for a better way of life and to flourish and to hope. How do we as psychologists provide hope for a transformational change of the kind that is required. Now, this might be something we want to focus on in the panel discussion afterwards, as I think it's quite a, a crucial issue. People live in a social and environmental context, and these conditions are no less relevant for the attention of psychologists. If we want to see changes in people's lifestyles and consumption, how can we provide people with the necessary psychological resources to enable them to change the conditions to sustain environmentally damaging actions and thereby change themselves as well? Instead of telling people what they should do to solve the climate crisis, how can psychology contribute to enabling people to find and realise their own solutions? If psychologists are to play a role in change, drawing on their research and taking advocacy roles, which are evidence-based, then we need to think about the different kinds of knowledges we collect and how they can be used. We must get beyond the idea that only psychologists who carry out experiments and talk numbers are of use to policymakers, practitioners and society in bringing about change. I've been talking about the different ways psychologists tackle the investigation of climate change and how the results of their work might feed into policy and impl implementation so, so that not only governments, but individuals and communities can also bring about real change. But underlying what I've been talking about is something which I think may be important for counselling psychologists. How we tackle climate change is strongly influenced by how we talk about climate change. Elif Shafak, the Turkish novelist, political scientist, women's and minority rights advocate, wrote an opinion piece in The Guardian on othering and prejudice, which is no less relevant, I think, in respect of how we bring about change and transformation globally in addressing the climate emergency. Elif Shafak wrote, data and factual information are crucial, but not enough to bring down the walls of numbness and indifference to help us empathise with people outside our tribes. We need emotional connections, but more than that, just as we need sisterhood against patriarchy, 
we need storyhood against bigotry. East or West, when we relate to others, we do so through stories. As counselling psychologists, I imagine you hear people's stories every day, powerful stories. I can't help but feel that you have in your grasp the emotional connections to which Alif Shafak refers. Stories can be meaningful, moving, and can change minds and provide hope, whether we're talking about mitigation or adaptation to the climate crisis as it unfolds and destroys our communities and our homes. Instead of devising behaviour change strategies, we should be talking to people about how they are bringing about change in their lives already and explore with them how to support, broaden and generalise these changes. Talk and stories are important to counselling psychologists, especially when it comes to helping clients who are anxious about climate change. Whether this is in relation to the direct effects, the secondary effects or consequential effects or the measures taken to mitigate and adapt. Counselling psychologists have an important role to play in each of these areas. We need to think about the way we talk about the climate emergency, because I hope, as I hope I have shown, it affects not only the way we frame our policies, understandings, positions, but it can also affect how we can act and how we think we can act. Thank you very much. Martin, you're mute. Oh dear. All right, um, Dave, I was saying thank you very, very much for that thought provoking um, lecture to us. And in the absence of a hall full of people clapping, let me just do the applause for you. Um, let me briefly, I, I know that there's going to be a lot of questions. We've already got a few questions coming in, so, and I know that more will be coming in. So let me briefly introduce the panel, um, and then we'll start with some of the questions. Um, yeah, I might actually, yeah. Um, so on the panel, as I say, we've got, uh, in order of my screen, we've got Dr. Alison Greenwood, um, who having worked as a counselling psychology psychologist in the NHS third sector and private practice, in 2018 founded the health, mental health charity Dose of Nature to support those referred by their GPs with a wide range of mental health problems by increasing their engagement with the natural world. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, Alison, but I suspect there's something there about hope in reconnecting to the natural world. But we'll hear more in a moment, I guess. Um, Patrick Kennedy Williams um, is a clinical psychologist who has specific interest in climate change anxiety and how to manage the adverse impacts of this on mental well-being to help support clients finding positive solutions to this problem. And I know that that was a key concern of many of our members who responded to the survey that we did um, yet last year. And finally, Maya Gimelova. Maya is a final year counseling psychology trainee at Regents University whose research interest lies in the impacts of climate change awareness on young climate activists. She feels deeply connected to nature and is concerned, I think as we all are, about the state of the panic, uh, of the planet. <laughs> My Freudian slip there. Um, so while we wait for a few more questions to come in, can I just ask the panel if anybody wants to kind of give first thoughts in relation to David's presentation? Alison, yep, great. You need to unmute. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, I just um, I'm so delighted, David, um, with you, you forefronting hope um, as um, as what what you're giving us all to discuss here. Um, I was thinking that that was my message that I was going to be pushing through um, everybody talking about um, you know, the panic, the crisis, the, the fear we have to um, you know, really um, sit up and take notice um, and, and be frightened in order to take action. And it's just wonderful, um, David, to hear that um, your message was one of um, let's, let's talk about hope, let's, let's give this a positive message. And, um, and that's what I hope this panel discussion is, is going to be doing more of. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Alison. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, can, I completely agree with that. And um, 
uh, highlighting that as a specific role of psychology as a profession and, and applied psychologists specifically. Um, another fantastic point that David made was around the, the power and influence of narratives, um, either sort of wider social narratives or individual narratives in the therapy room. Um, and again, I think both, both of those areas, certainly uh, we're finding ourselves doing a lot of work in promoting, but it's, it's such a key, key area here in terms of the stories we tell uh, and the stories we receive around, around climate change. Um, I really enjoyed this talk. So many interesting ideas. And I guess the one that stayed with me and was refreshing to hear that it's not only about behavioral change and individualistic change, but we need to act um, kind of societal transformation and the meanings we attach to um, to things we engage and the example with showering which just really stayed with me very interesting thank you um one of the questions i want to pose initially I'm, no one of the questions i want to pose initially because it came up so strongly in the survey we did um was i think i think colleagues find there being a real tension between the individual and the collective to listen to these stories of narratives that, that you know, when we're depressed, when we're anxious, we, what we might take to our therapist might be the despair, might be the impotence, the how do I connect to, you know, how do I individually do my own Lucas plan? And I guess I'm kind of wondering whether we can start with that, kind of as applied psychologists, how do we engage with the individual? Do we, do we bother with that collective? How do we focus exclusively on the individual? How do you, in your work, start to think or, or engage with bridging those two or do you should i, should I start Patrick, start with that one um <clears throat> i think it's um it's an interesting dichotomy the individual and the collective and, and i suppose what we're talking about here largely is about is about efficacy i know that david also mentioned efficacy at points in his in his talk as well which is hugely important and how we engender uh, a sense of individual efficacy but collective efficacy as well um, and we've certainly in my sort of clinical work have, have found that it it can there can be backlashes both ways so if people are sort of perceiving themselves to be making a huge amount of individual change um, they can become quite readily frustrated when family members or the, or the sort of wider systems in which they exist don't don't seem to be responding in in quite the same way and they, they can be what we sort of call the dejection problem where people can sort of end up with a sense of well actually what's the point if 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 the, if the sort of the systems in which i'm operating aren't aren't, aren't matching my level of, of personal sort of quote unquote sacrifice um but i think the individual is the collective and i think that's where that's where sort of things like you know any any sort of individual impacts on policy um, or or activism, these sorts of things where we can bridge that gap between individual act actions and collective actions become hugely important. And this is where a lot of people will sort of come back and say, actually, these are the things where they feel um, they're making the, the greatest impact is because it's not just an individual act action, they're linking out to, to be, be part of something bigger. That's obviously beneficial from a from an impact perspective, but also from a well-being perspective as well, because that then that then feeds into all the sort of other very beneficial aspects of all of this in terms of connection um, and um, uh, as well. So, I think um, always certainly therapeutically always being on the lookout for opportunities for individual individual action to have some sort of collective component and bringing people together. Great, thank you. Okay, Alison. Yeah, so, um, I think um, in the work that I do, I think the first thing and when people come with um, um, anxiety over the state of the world is, is really important to acknowledge it, not to dismiss it, not to downplay it in any way. In particular, I think that's important with young people. Um, I see a lot of parents who, who come and talk about their children and say, I don't know what to do with them because they're just getting so worked up about you know, the, um, the planet and the state of the earth and you know, they're really need to be concentrating on their GCSEs. Um, and I think um, acknowledging to, um, to anybody that's experiencing um, any kind of um, 
that we're going to call it eco-anxiety and um, climate grief. Um, it's really important to, uh, I think, for all of us to um, start to understand in our therapy rooms that this is a really important issue um, for a growing number of people. And I think um, around the world, various surveys have been done suggesting that you up to 50% of people now are presenting with um, anxiety over the state of the planet and it, it's getting closer it's affecting our lives um, you know really close to home it's it's no longer um, something we see on tv um, and, and in the news of climate um, disasters around the world um, and we can just kind of look at that and feel some compassion and empathy and um, then get on with our lives it's um, as we've seen recently um, with the flooding um, but also the the fact it's affecting um, I'm seeing in, in um, my work that it's affecting people um, in their daily lives, just increased temperatures, um, the way it's um, creating more aggression, um, domestic abuse, uh, um, heat stress, um, people just just losing patience with their families. Um, so this, once we start seeing that um, and understanding how this is affecting people's daily lives, I think um, then there's a, a greater urgency uh, for people to think we need to do something about it. It, it doesn't feel um, such a, re a remote problem. And I think focusing on that um, at an individual level and also at a societal level um, is gonna be important. People are motivated, I think, when they can see uh, if something very close to them um, being affected and the impact on their, on their daily lives. Great, thank you. Maya, David, any thoughts? Um, Maya, yeah. The, yeah, it's interesting that the last comment, I was thinking what occurred to me, I wondered in in your experience of talking to people who are coming coming to you, presenting with these, these issues, do you get the feeling that they're talking to other people as well? Is this a sort of, socially shared anxiety or do people feel oh i won't mention it to my friend or my neighbors because they'll think i'm a bit silly or something like that um i i, I think david is a really good point i think that generally speaking they're not doing i think this is something that um, as a society we're not recognizing yet as as something as um as important as we ought to be doing an anxiety that is a valid anxiety to have i yeah. think uh, it's, it's getting there but it's still not something so I think people are talking about it in the therapy room quite often for the first time um, you know, just specific issues um, young I've had a, um, a young woman recently who was very anxious about having children I think this is becoming more more common yet yeah, there's something that you know, are they going to um, bring children is that an ethical um, ethically valid thing to be doing to bringing children into the world and I think that's going to become um, something that as therapists we see more and more in the therapy room um, I think there are um, we're going to see more and more people involved in eco eco activism I think um, with burnout in the therapy room um, I've, I've had a, a, a few people I've worked with um, some some people from Extinction Rebellion and who are um, you, we're going to be talking probably about being act, you know, doing something um, and activism being a solution to um, some of the uh, mental health issues that um, can result as a, as a result of um, eco-anxiety and, and climate grief. Um, and, and I think um, it can certainly be, I think the research bears that out, that actually feeling as if you're doing something and actively engaging um, is, is something that mitigates against feelings of helplessness and hopelessness, as, as, as you said, David. But I also think um, there is a line and actually people that get very involved um, can become um, very affected by eco-anxiety. And I think we have to, yeah, we're going to be more of that. I think children are a good example of that as well with, with the various different um, actions that they are being encouraged to, to participate in. Um, it's having, in some cases, I think a negative impact um, on their lives and as they're getting kind of more and more um, distressed by and, and more knowledge of what's going on in the world. So I think there's um, something to bear in mind too. Can I just add, I completely echo what you're saying there, Alison, in terms of um, that, the importance of that, of that line. Um, I would say, it's probably been your experience as well, but I would say overwhelmingly, the majority of people who, who get in contact with us for some form of individual work, um, I would say most of that work is around 
actually giving themselves the permission to disengage from their climate work you know outside of a certain amount of time and when we when we when we first started climate psychologists it was uh, our sort of tagline was anxiety to action which we thought great yes because anxiety or action is the antidote to anxiety quite soon we had to really we had to nuance that whole idea because it became clear that actually that was perpetuating all you know for a lot of the people who were kind of coming forward with these kind of things like you said high sort of um eco-awareness very sort of deeply embedded green identity doing probably quite a lot either within their jobs or outside of their jobs evenings weekends actually this this message of action alleviates anxiety it's true up until a point and so what we started talking about was was achieving sustainable action you know and by which we mean action that's not not only sustainable for the planet but sustainable for yourself as well particularly where people were sort of coming and saying actually i'm feeling quite alone in this like we talked about earlier sort of that that collective action not being not being mirrored by their individual action that kind of thing it, and burnout absolutely is a, is a really key issue i'd say in in answering to david's question about um whether these are things that people are coming with sort of um having not really had the opportunity to speak with in, in their networks prior to the therapy room i think there you can you can sort of separate out the different groups i would say work we've done with with youth activists they tend that they're sort of they're tending to create regular opportunities to have these kind of emotion focused conversations really interesting we did some work with generation climate europe which is a sort of the umbrella for for youth activist groups across europe around climate anxiety and they'd already been holding sort of semi regular how you guys feeling type um you know group zoom sessions and actually this is that they're starting to embed this and starting to embed these sorts of conversations in and speaking with youth activists around the world there's a real collective sense of the importance for self care the importance of communicating with one another um i would say the people who perhaps feel a little bit more isolated are those people who are coming forward individually usually young young adults i could i had this question a lot as well about um about having children or having more children and, and the ethical and moral decisions around around that and gosh if there's a, if there's a question that i don't have an answer to at all it's that one it's really complicated for people um and so the, you know these these sorts of um the, these clients that come forward don't necessarily have those systems around them it's a lot more difficult because they because they don't they don't have the ability to, to to openly talk about these things that's changing though and you know there are climate cafes propping up all over the world i know that the um, um, the Climate Psychology Alliance here in the UK are running sort of regular climate discussions and that's something much like the death cafes you know in the grief in the grief network so I think these these sorts of things are, are creating more of a sort of um, a community level opportunity for people that I think we as psychologists should be really, uh, really driving these sorts of initiatives where we can. Um, I bring you in at this point Maya because I know that your yeah. work is around this area and I'd be curious as to whether it's similar or different to what we've been hearing? Yeah, so I feel like it was interesting to hear Alison and Patrick's experience, but I feel like there is a discrepancy between what the data reports that people are very anxious, majority report feeling anxious about climate change, but then uh, how much of these people actually come to the therapy room if it's not specifically advertised uh, kind of around ecological distress and support. I think um, in my clinical work, I've had a few clients um, with whom we've discussed this distress, but it was secondary to the main problem that they came in with. So I think it really depends on the context of therapy as well, whether it's an NHS or maybe private targeted for um, climate specific anxiety. Um, but in my, in my work and my research, uh, I've interviewed um, young climate activists um, to uh, learn about the, their experiences of um, inf climate information awareness and how that might impact their well-being. And what I've learned is that um, they very much, as Patrick said, share between their network of um, activists, they do cafes and debriefing, but they, they keep that topic very separate from their personal lives as they feel like it might impact their intimate relationship family relationship, especially families are not on the same page as they are. So yes, I feel like um, it is being talked, but very in specific groups and maybe in specific therapy contexts from my experience. 
Great, thank you. Um, I wonder if I could turn to a couple of questions. Actually, just a thing to say about this is that there's a lot of comment being made on the discussion forum saying, excellent point, well done, I thought that too. Ooh, how am I gonna think about this? So there's lots of discussion going on, that's really wonderful. And there are a few questions coming in as well. Um, we'll start with Robin's one, which might take us into a slightly different place to where we've just been. Robin Trawartha writes, I came into this presentation with some skepticism, which is interesting because that came out in our survey last year as well. I came into this presentation with some skepticism, but David's presentation around the Lucas plan made me think differently. He highlighted how structural inequalities stopped the implementation of the Lucas plan. And I think we know how many structural in inequalities are being highlighted in recent years around all kinds of uh, different foci. Um, so his question is, any thoughts on how psychology, and maybe applied psychology too, might confront such obstacles as they are so powerful? So thoughts to... Alison? Um, well, I was just going to say, I don't know if this is, is what the question was um, was uh, referring to, but inequalities in the work that I do um, around access to nature. So just kind of to, to lead from activism as, as being um, a way of um, supporting people, supporting people's eco-anxiety and, and distress around um, what's happening to the planet <clears throat> um, is, is a, another way of... Um, supporting people is connecting them to nature and that's um, that's the work that, that I do um, at the the charity the, um, Dose of Nature and there is um, emerging evidence I'd say it's fairly recent some really great work that Miles Davison's doing at Derby University and and others around the country and I would say around the world um, in the link between connecting people to nature and then their pro-environmental behaviors um, it's not really new work but I think there's there's more of it happening and, and it's getting more noticed um, that work and so I think um, connecting people to nature it is a really important uh, thing that we need to be doing um, but of course there are huge inequalities um, in in trying to connect people to nature and um, one very many I could yeah do the whole talk on the different inequalities connected with nature but um, I guess access to nature is, is a really important um, one and um, helping people to understand um, that um, you know, nature is around every corner and so increasing our connection to nature we don't need to go into the mountains or to the seaside or into the middle of the countryside which of course you know being a an urban nation you know, is very um, an urban world is is um, not always that easy, but that just by walking out of our back door, we can we can get a dose of nature just by looking up at the sky, same sky um, outside our back door um, that it is in the middle of the, the mountains or the countryside, and that we can feel the weather, that we can um, engage with street trees, um, we can notice um, the air on our faces and on our skin, um, and we can um, look at the birds, the insects, and um, things that we don't need to be in the middle of forests to do. So I think um, that's a, an, an educational um, a very important um, thing that we should be trying to teach everybody that there's nature, we can all access nature uh, if we think about um, it in a different way. Um, inequalities as well, I think the pandemic had a lot to teach, so I don't know if we're going to talk about that later, but um, when we saw how people uh, that weren't used to being in natural spaces um, found it difficult um, to respect those natural spaces because they had no um, understanding, they had no sense of belonging to, and um, we, I, um, live in the borough of Richmond and um, the people at Richmond Park were absolutely outraged um, during the pandemic to see, I don't know if this was something that um, occurred around the world in places near you, but to see the littering and the lack of respect um, that many people that were actually in these places for the first time um, were demonstrating towards um, natural spaces. And again, this is about people, I think, um, you know, inequalities, people not having um, the same uh, understanding or the same sense of belonging, the same feeling that this is for them and that they're part of nature. So again, part of the work of connecting people to nature, making people feel that they belong to the natural world, they're part of the natural world, um, will obviously then encourage them to, to want to invest in it, to look after it and to respect it. Can I just make a plug for the work you do? Um, people may want to look at Dose of Nature's Instagram because one thing I've noticed about it is that every now and again there are these like mini educations kind of like today we're doing it in this way today we're doing it in this accessible day-to-day -day way um and so i mean obviously there's other places to look as well but um you are kind of getting that message out there as well so yeah anybody else want to yeah, comment on. on the inequality yep david 
I'll chip in there. So I'm, I'm sort of looking at the questions as well. Given that Alison, what Alison and Patrick have both been talking about inequalities, there's a question that's come up about someone saying, you know, there's this person has uh, clients in the NHS that uh, yeah. experience significant and severe poverty, anxiety where they're going to get the next meal from, anxiety about the environment is a luxury. I mean, it, it's this is always a, a is a tricky one, but I don't think we can afford to have an arms race over who's got the most serious problems. Um, I think one of the messages behind what I was saying is that social transformation is not simply about the environment. It's about the whole package. And when we, you know, if we get decent jobs, just jobs, for example, get rid of, um, you know, um, precarious jobs, people will have, hopefully would have good wages, good, good working conditions and so on. It's, I think, breaking these things. I had a, I had a, had a got a very good friend who's an environmental education officer in South Africa. And he, he would always talk about the chest of drawers when it comes to environmental education that so often people open one drawer and that's the sort of the environment drawer. Then they'd open the democracy drawer and then there's the literacy drawer. Then there's the health drawer as if these are all different aspects, but they all interact. And I think that what, what we need, what we're talking about, what I'm trying to talk about here is we've just got to look at the whole basis of the way we're organizing society, if you like, in a sense, you know, we've got to, go back and say, you know, if we're going to have um, a sustainable environment, you know, that's going to require, probably not a good expression, but sustainable jobs, sustainable food system, sustainable, you know, across the board. Um, I, th I think that's the way yeah. I would respond to that. I think that's picking off particular issues, particular, particular injustices or inequalities is is kind of it's not that's not misses the point but i think we've got to go back a step and look at the whole picture and i think for my part one of the um hopeful you know when you were talking about hope earlier one of the hopeful things i have is the fact of seeing so much reference nowadays to intersectional environmentalism or um environmental racism you know we're seeing the fact that underpinning some of these injustices, some of unpinning these inequalities, is a recognition that the same processes are at work. And so very often we need to kind of take those on board in order to help people find a sense of agency in their own lives, as well as in collective responses. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, want to agree. Uh, yeah no, I, I, was, I was thinking the same thing about in, intersectional environmentalism and, and about how it, in the climate crisis has been increasingly seen as a as a as a racial issue as a as a uh, poverty issue uh as a issue of gender as well you know um and i think this is this is a hugely important transformation that's happening in 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 the people's kind of awareness uh climate awareness yeah. um i think in terms of what we can do what we can be doing in terms of power imbalances you know that i think there's been some really interesting um uh i think it was i oh, was it the, U, the uk student climate group i can't really i can send the link afterwards but they've put together a sort of you know youth again young people youth climate youth climate activists very aware of the, of the structural power imbalances that exist for them in terms of their ability to 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 influence policy to influence change that sort of thing and and they've sort of created some guidelines for what they call adult allies and this is about saying okay actually how can the influ influential adults around us who might have knowledge and expertise in in legal issues and policy and research you know or, or might have the sort of the, the ability to form those connections uh, to, to influence wider change this is one way that, that that young people have identified the role of of adults in their work as being able to support them to to redress the, the power imbalances and then of course there are other power imbalances around and there's a really excellent point around working with nhs clients for whom poverty you know poverty and and, and financial pressures actually trump that you know in in very immediate sense pull a lot of their their daily worries to, to to dealing with with that we also work from work with people in sort of more affected 
uh, or more effective mapper um, regions, more effective people in areas. And, you know, again, that's something where, you know, we, we've asked this question and it, it, it ties in some of these ideas of sort of white saviorism and the whiteness of, of, you know, the luxury of the whiteness of climate anxiety is something we've heard a lot about recently. And it's a really important point. Mm. Um, and so we, we've been trying to reach out as much as we can to actually how, you know, what, what, how, what do, what do you need from us as, as, as psychologists representing, um, these kind of geographical, more, you know, more, more developed areas. Um, and they, you know, and they're, they're, the message is quite clear. It's about sort of giving people opportunities to, you know, essentially pass the mic, you know, don't feel the need to provide a voice for the voiceless, but rather give us the mic and let us let us tell our own story. And I think psychology as a profession has always has, has been fantastic and, and it continues to be fantastic at, at being able to sort of, um, well, firstly, the fact that the mere fact that we're having these conversations uh, around kind of structural um, inequalities and power imbalances at a, at a wider community and global level kind of says a lot about our profession and the way that we view things and our ability to hold in mind the systems that are at play and that I think that again puts us at a really in a really important position so you know um, I think the, the being able to look at the structural imbalances not just at a, at a community or national level but actually globally as well I think is really important. Mm. And I guess listening to you, what comes to mind is the social justice agenda that counseling psychologists value so much. So although we can perhaps address inequalities in a ther therapy, therapeutic uh, setting, um, as Alice suggested, or, you know, um, really be being aware of inequalities that climate change um, um, leads to, um, also thinking about social justice agenda, perhaps counseling psychologists can be more active um, and go out in the world and advocate and work with populations that are more vulnerable um, or endure um, the consequences, says the hardest. Um, yeah real opportunities here as well at, at a, um, a, a policy level I think um, David I was struck by um, that quote um, that you put up on on the screen options that do not map onto present policy will be ignored and I think there are real opportunities at the moment with them um, the environment and health particularly mental health being right up there on top of the agenda um, uh, yeah, globally um, as, as two of the the major issues of our time and there are, there are so many um, kind of win-win um, scenarios and, and actions that we might take. I think health, um, I heard recently that, that health um, departments and environmental departments um, have been merged in some local authorities in this country um, and, are, and are working together on various policies. So these two big pots of money that have you know, been separate and, and going along doing their own thing. I think now we can see how we can have some real kind of win-win situations if we, if we think about these two um, hugely important um, agendas now and just just things like planting trees and um, that obviously is going to be good for the environment but um, massively important for um, individuals mental health and well-being and um, to create more spaces um, for us to to be in these green spaces for the mental health benefits that we get from um, being in natural environments and of course you're know, planting trees together and that community action is going to support mental well-being too um, and as Maya says um, you know, support us with that um, social action that, that is so good for, for our well-being. Um, things like policies around uh, cycling and walking um, are going to be really good for yeah, addressing pollution and air quality and noise pollution but also obviously that's going to have a huge impact on mental health as well um we know that's going to get people outside more walking um and cycling um physical activity is good for mental health um also reduction in noise pollution that we're going to get if we do more cycling um and walking is going to be good for mental well-being with noise pollution being one of the um greatest pollutants um in terms of um an adverse effect on mental well-being. So I think if we start looking at these kind of win-win scenarios, these co-benefits of these uh, these two big pots of money that we know are out there, people wanting to, yeah, they're right at the top of the agendas, um, then I think that's going to be really um, helpful. Can I, can I just come in and make a point there? Um, that slide that I put up with the quote from the NERC about, you know, aligning one's research with policy, I didn't want that to be taken as saying I agree with that, quite the opposite. I mean, <laughs> um, 
I think the example you gave, though, of what's happening at the moment, COVID crisis, mental health issues, and aligning the environment that is, is absolutely spot on, because they're all part of the same problem. But I put that, that slide up to make the point that, you know, we as psychologists should be thinking independently about what we think the real issues are, not simply what doing what the government wants us to do in order to fulfill their agenda. So that's just like to make that clear. <laughs> okay, I, wonder if I, I wonder if I could link something that's been said in the discussion with um, a question as well. So Ro Robin Trawatha notes that he's not a dance instructor. And by that, what he's referring to is this, I think, going by his previous comment, um, how do we know if we're attending too closely to inequality or how do we know if we're attending too much to this bit or that bit? You know, how do we do the dance, I guess, between the kind of the, the personal work and the context that we're in? And in regard to that, I wonder if Matt Hancock's question to us, you know, should we as a BPAS be doing more to support the development of ecotherapy and eco-group therapy? It's how do we ourselves not just encourage our clients to think about what they do personally and how that links into the collective. But what is the role of psychologists at both the kind of therapeutic and the political? Alison, you've just mentioned pots of money and stuff. And I'm not sure that would be in everybody's realm, in everybody's kind of work life. How do we, how do we become a dance instructor or dance, an effective dancer to move between these levels in a way that doesn't burn us out and also show some effect, um, is effective? And for that, I meant thoughts and ideas, not well worked out answers that we can all pick up immediately, necessarily. Martin, do you need I mean, you... one? Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to clarify the question really from, from Martin and what he was, um, I was going to ask you, meaning okay. in, in the therapy room, um, or do you mean how do we do the therapy room stuff and the, the stuff that we might do outside in terms of um, our own kind of influencing? Um, yep, and, and in doing so, how do we how do we stay grounded? I suppose knowing that we are dancing, we are moving between levels, we are trying to do very intimate therapeutic work as well as macro level interventions or activity. How do we? I would say very easily because we're counselling psychologists, and that's what we do. Um, I think that's right at the you know kind of core of of what we are, who we are, that we, that we work with individuals um, and, and we work um, on a holistic level um, in terms of you know, people's wider environment and then the community level, national level, global level. I think that's, that's fundamental to who we are and what we do. I, yeah. It almost sounded like, Martin, you've, you've kind of described my week a little bit, <laughs> uh, probably for you, Alison, as, as well, but it, it I, I definitely sort of find myself doing that same dance, you know, in, and I think that's partly because climate psychologists that we really sort of founded two, two or three years ago is very young and we're still trying to work out really what we're, you know, what the core of our work is, but it, it pulls very much from a very, like you said, the intimacy of the one-to-one -one therapy environment to then sudden, you know, to consulting with government, consulting with banks, you know, with media organisations who are asking questions like how do we write climate change into movie scripts and this this sort of thing and, and TV drama, um, working with activists, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so it, it does it absolutely feels like a dance. And at, at, at times it sort of, it, it, I, I suppose if we found ourselves doing psychology in the broadest, in the broadest sense, so you can sort of feel a little bit like a jack of all trades and master of none. What I would say is I, I really... I think what you kind of alluded to, Martin, there was you used the word burnout, and it sounds like what you were sort of uh, suggesting, and I could fully, fully support this, is, is the idea of I think everyone needs to give themselves the permission to not be and do everything. Um, you know, that's I think that's true of the people that we work with. That's true of ourselves as well. And you know, I, I think we have the potential as a, as a as a profession, I'm including clinical psychology in this, of course, but you know, as applied psychologists. Um, we do have the skill set to be able to do that dance and to go from one one to the next. It, I suppose um, it, it, a lot of it depends on on the, the core of your work and your on your on your day to day. Really, um, I, I definitely as, as 
it's interesting, Ma, you were saying that you sort of in a in a general practice you hadn't necessarily you hadn't noticed a huge number of people presenting with climate related issues as a primary concern. And I think I, I there's a few other research projects going on in the UK at the moment in the NHS. I think it's going to mirror that finding. Actually, I don't I, don't, I wouldn't be at all surprised. And whether that's to do with people not necessarily being aware of that um, of the possibility of that. Um, coming forwards. Interestingly, I've had the first ins uh, first insurance referral to, to us uh, a couple of weeks ago for primarily for climate anxiety, which is the first time I've seen that. So I wonder whether there is there is a bit of a step change, a bit of a culture change, um, you know, whether it's to do with the fact that people just aren't necessarily aware they can come forward with these issues uh, for psychological therapies or not, I don't know. Or I'm thinking whether it is a question about awareness or Clients feeling like they are going to be misunderstood in in the context such as you know not specific um, to climate distress and you know there's so much mm -hmm. media has been around that are attacking activism and echo anxiety and just portraying it in such a um, wrong light that perhaps clients are withholding and then I'm now thinking how do we as psychologists um, welcome that and and make them, you know, understand that it's okay to talk about it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but returning to the to the question, previous one, yes, by nature, I think counseling psychologists are multitasking. But I'm thinking we can do all this individually. But do we need then a, a, a more structural support and on a higher level from BPS creating groups and work streams? And I think. It has been proven a little bit difficult to recruit um, some people to, to be interested in that and engage. And I'm just wondering, well, where's the gap? Why is that? And I don't want to be controversial, but I, I've, um, I am part of some WhatsApp groups and I see a lot of clinical psychologists that feels like being more vocal or engaged. And I'm thinking, why? Well, what's happening? What do we need to be able to, you know, be more involved in this issue as, as a group rather than individual counseling psychology? Counseling psychology. Good question. Oh, Alison, yeah. I just wanted, to, I mean, it is a good question, but I just really wanted to pick up on what um, uh, Mai was saying and, and Patrick as well about people not presenting um, in the room and the research suggesting um, that um, you know, it's not eco-anxiety and climate grief isn't something that's bringing people to, to therapy. Um, but I wonder if actually um, the confidence, the way we live our lives now is bringing people to therapy. I see a lot more people um, just coming who don't really know why they're depressed, why they're low, why they're anxious. They just don't feel mm -hmm. great. And actually when they start to look at their lives I think they've got you know they've got friends they've, they've got a good job they've got um we're seeing more and more people like that that are just miserable and um and lost and feel isolated and then you start to look at their lives and you find out that you know over the last couple of years they've spent um their lives up in the attic they're not even going out to work um sometimes only you know, five ten minutes um outside to get a loaf of bread and you know, it can be less than an hour in a week that they're actually outside um, under the sky um, in, in the fresh air. And I think, and then you start to think, okay, so yeah, maybe this has something to do with um, why you're feeling depressed and anxious because you're so disconnected from um, the world in which you evolved, that your bodies and brains, the same bodies and brains that um, evolved um, under the sky in natural environments is now being um, put in this tiny box um, looking at walls and ceilings. And um, it's causing distress, it's causing anxiety, it's causing uh, you know, huge um, stress on, on our systems. And so I think that's something to be aware of when people um, arrive, uh, perhaps they're not aware that, um, that their anxiety is caused by um, climate change. This is one of the really interesting conversations I've had a lot with uh, teaching groups in terms of that counseling psychology value of um, don't force an idea, and, and it's in the discussion here, let's not force ideas onto our clients. But the fact that actually just waiting until something is formulated and given to us fully prepared in verbal form that misses enormous amounts as well. So I think actually this kind of understanding these pressures, understanding the what's being spoken emotionally, means that we've got to evolve our assessment 
skills. We've got to evolve our formulation skills. We've got to keep in mind, and it is intersectional, so it might be racism, it might be poverty that comes to the fore first, but then how is that fitting in with all of this? And actually daring to put it on the table, and clients may say to us, no, uh, that doesn't ring any bells at all, that's not relevant to me. Or it might be part of what comes together out of that interaction, but being able to not to get past just the assertion of it is this, because then, as you say, we're missing a whole swathe of people who come to us just with, I don't know why I feel so crap. I don't know why I feel so scared. I don't know why I feel this. I feel and a very uh, uh, Oh, sorry, go ahead, David. I was just going to say, I've been very struck by this, this phrase about giving permission. And I think it speaks to the, what we've been talking about over the last 10 minutes or so. Um, and certainly when I was when I was thinking about the paper, I was thinking, well, OK, you as, you as counselling psychologists hear, hear those stories. But how do you then, how can those stories be then used? And it seems to me that we talk about the environment very much in hard terms um, rather than you might say soft terms but getting people to talk about their feelings about the environment not just isn't it wonderful to be out in the sun but their, the anxieties that they're feeling so it's almost like it's a point i was making i think about um you know moving away from top down to bottom up that getting people to start to construct solutions themselves and maybe one of the starting points of that solution making is talking to other people and showing that and, and realizing that other people have the same feelings and anxieties that they do but then in turn if that is then what's it i can't think of the right word but if that is then becomes part of the environment narrative so we don't just talk about climate change as something to do with you know the physical effects and all of that uh, or even uh you know conflict and so on but we talk about what what it actually means to people at an individual level and at a collective level so that becomes part of the public discourse as well i think that that could well be a very important starting point because i think at the moment people do feel you know they haven't necessarily got permission to talk about these things that people will think they're maybe slightly odd or or people don't share these views just a thought, i don't know absolutely and i was struck by one of the um delegates who wrote in the discussion about her ex i think it was her amy who talked about her experience of as she walked the dog picking up litter and actually seeing some really what's, what looks like some really horrible aggressive kind of negative reactions to it as if by personally doing something that you're quite happy with you may still engender not just people not knowing or people not understanding but actually being quite antagonistic and it sounds like a horrible experience so hearing these stories is going to be really really important i think but sorry i just realized patrick you would also wanted to say something weren't you oh so i was i was just to lead on from what david was saying about the about the the the, the need for a sort of um bottom-up sort of community-led approach to starting these conversations i completely completely agree with that i think there is a role as well for a sort of a, 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 and by top down i suppose i, I mean um, sort of representative as representative of certain communities so sort of starting to convey a message that this is something that can be spoken about I know that in the in the scientific community there was a, a, a great project someone called Joe Duggan did a did a project called this is this how you feel very simple premise where uh, prominent uh, climate scientists would write beautiful handwritten letters and send them to him purely around the emotional impact of the work that they were doing and that sort of became part of a culture shift in in the in, in that community which is all about um being able to express the the the, the emotional impact of the work that, that they were doing and then sort of fast forward to to now and then and there's a much greater awareness of the the, the need for people who work in, in climate science sustainability professionals higher rates of burnout higher degrees of distress as in, and you know and, and now there are sort of um there are 
if you like, sort of psychological provisions being planned and designed specifically for supporting people working in that space. But I think there was there was something about there's the message and then there's the messenger. And I think um, sort of uh, interesting. I was speaking to broadcasters about this, not that, again because um, they, they were asking questions. Uh, sports broadcasters were asking questions about actually, I wonder if we could get some key sportsmen to be having conversations about climate change, about the emotional impact, about talking about climate and that sort of thing. We're thinking, wow, we're having really quite again intersectional conversations here about about um, about the, having these sorts of conversations. So I think a bottom up approach, absolutely, but a, a, a sort of a, a top down approach as well, kind of engaging kind of key sort of uh, representatives or key stakeholders in, in various sort of um, professions and industries. I think it's had a really positive benefit as well. Great. Um, I'm having to do my best Fiona Bruce or David Dimbleby thing right now because I'm aware that we've got three minutes left before we get what I believe is called a hard cutoff or something. So we will lose the um, togetherness of this at that point. So is there, in the style of question time, is there anything from the panellists in about 45 seconds that you might want to say is your final piece today? Um, who, should, who wants to go first? I, I think quickly, uh, just a thought came up that we as uh, practitioners need to understand our emotions as well, because we might have defences that will prevent to speak to clients about climate change distress. So work and understanding our own emotions. Thank you, Maya. Alison. Um, well, I want two, two quick things. One, I just wanted to, we haven't had much chance to talk about it, but but mention again, and David's, um, when he talked about research, how important it is, I think, as counselling psychologists to be part of um, the research going forward, because I think a story is, um, good quality, qualitative research, um, individual client case studies is going to be really important in this emerging field. Um, and I think we really need to be right at the forefront of that. Uh, and the other thing I was going to say was, and um, we talked a lot about um, eco-anxiety and, um, and, you know, the, the effects on, um, on mental health, but actually um, there's something to be harnessed here, which can really have a very positive effect on well-being. And when people get involved in community and come together um, and, and start to feel as if they've got some power, um, lose the helplessness and get some hope um, back to David's push, um, then I think it can be a very positive thing as well. And as counseling psychologists, obviously we was on that focus on well-being. Thank you. Patrick, David? Patrick? I'll, I'll let I'll let David I'll let David uh, I'll let David finish, but it was just okay, just just one. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. As I said at the beginning, if anyone wants to write in um, and get a copy of the paper, I'm very happy to send it out. So with all the references and all that kind of stuff. So I'm very pleased to do that. But thank you. Thanks, David. So the last word to yourself well other than mine last word to you patrick <laughs> i was i was just remind reminded today of uh, when i was doing my training and we'd have lots of different lectures and, and workshops and seminars about different areas of, 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 of sort of mental illness or well-being different sorts of things that people might present within the therapy room and we always came away with a sense of actually we've got the skills already here you know we, we this is all sort of within our skill set we became what we our sort of efficacy grew and grew and grew with each with each each time we had these lectures even though the topic or the, the presenting issue was different actually we were, we were sort of still coming on sort of relying on the same core skill set and i think with climate it's exactly the same so my, my hope is that if all the delegates feel a sense of actually yes this is something we should be focusing more on but actually this is there's a core skill set that everybody has here that's hugely hugely relevant to, to climate work um um, and so, yeah, it's, it's fantastic to, to have been able to. Have, um, so I'm so great. This is a stra uh, glad. This is a strand on the on the conference this year. It's excellent. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so, on behalf of the meeting today, can I thank you all again um, for your contributions, David? Thank you for your paper. Um, I certainly will be writing to you to grab a copy of it. But thank you so much for giving us your time and attention. Same to the panelists. And in the last 20 seconds, just to remind all the delegates that um, Alison, Patrick and Maya are all doing workshops here today. So if you're interested in the work they've been talking about or, or to hear more about their kind of interest and things, please do find yourself in those workshops um, later on. But thank you all for coming. And now I'm told it should have had the hard stop, but I don't know if it has.
the hard stuff has happened, but if delegates popped out to Zoom, they could still be in here. So I'm going to end the session for all now. Thanks all. Enjoy okay. the rest of the conference. Thank you. Yeah.